All right, this is unit two, concept three notes, and these are pretty long. We're gonna divide these over several days in class, but for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna go all the way through, and we're gonna talk about Newton's laws. So first, we need to understand what a force is. A force, which is abbreviated as a capital F in an equation, is a push or pull one object exerts on another. It is measured in a unit called newtons. One newton, which is abbreviated as a capital N, equals one kilogram times a meter per second squared. Forces can cause a change in an object's motion, and that's the connection we are going to be making between the first half of this unit on motion and the second half on force, is that they are related to each other. More than one force can also act on an object at one time. And so something that's important to know is net force. This is the combining of forces when two or more forces act on an object. So let's say on this stack of books, there's a force of two newtons pushing to the right. And there's a force of five newtons pushing to the left. The net force on this box would be three newtons to the left. Because two newtons pushing right would cancel out with two newtons pushing left, leaving only three newtons left over pushing to the left. That's what net force is. So when forces are acting on an object, they can be balanced or unbalanced. Balanced forces are forces that are equal in size and opposite in direction. So they would not cause a change in motion because the net force on the object would be zero. Here's an example. Let's say I'm pushing on the stack of books with the force of four newtons to the right, and someone else is pushing with a force of four newtons to the left. These would cancel out and the net force would be zero newtons, so the stack of books would not move like it did in the first example. Now, forces can be unbalanced like we first saw. This is when forces that are not equal in size and opposite in direction basically are applied to an object. This would cause a change in the motion um, of an object. So, force of two newtons pushes right, and a force of seven newtons pushes right. So we've got nine newtons total pushing right. A force of three newtons is pushing left. So nine and three, that leaves us six newtons as our net force pushing to the right. These would be unbalanced and would cause a change in motion in the stack of books. Now, throughout these notes, we're gonna be introducing Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion that he came up with in 1687 that talk about how forces affect an object's motion. So first we're going to start with Newton's first law. And it says an object will move at a constant velocity until a net force acts on it. Another way of saying this is an object in motion will stay in motion unless a force acts on it. And an object at rest will stay at rest unless a force acts on it. Now, the, this picture. Those bowling pins are going to stay at rest until a force, like the bowling ball, acts on them. And then when the bowling ball hits them, they will move. The bowling ball is going to continue in motion until a force um, acts on them to stop, such as um, when it hits the pins or the friction from the surface it's rolling on. And those things can stop the, bo the bowling ball. This is just an example of Newton's first law. Newton's first law is also known as the law of inertia, so it's important to know what inertia is. It is a tendency of an object to resist a change in motion. So, the more mass an object has, the more inertia it's going to have. So, it would be a lot easier to knock over a kindergartner than it would be to knock over an NFL linebacker because if an NFL linebacker has more mass, so they're going to have more inertia. They're going to resist a change in motion more. We see this um, in a car all the time, and this is why seatbelts are important. When you slam on your brakes, or whoever's driving your car slams on their brakes, your body will fly forward because it wants to stay in motion like it was before you braked. It was moving forward with the car. This is why we wear a seatbelt, so that it'll prevent, it'll help your body um, resist a change in motion a little bit better instead of wanting to keep flying forward. All right, now in class, we're going to pause and practice what we talked about so far. But again, for the sake of this video, we're going to keep moving forward. So what kinds of forces change an object's motion? What are some kind of common forces, if you will? One force is friction. This is a resistance to motion when two objects are in contact with one another. 
Another force that we commonly see is air resistance. This is resistance an object feels when it's traveling through air. And then another common force is gravity. It's the attraction two objects have on one another. The force of gravity is what pulls us towards Earth um, when you jump in the air or when you fall. And so we're going to kind of go through these three common forces a little bit more closely. So first let's talk about friction. It depends on two things. First, the roughness of the surface. The rougher the surface, the greater the friction. This is because rougher surfaces have greater microwelds. These are microscopic bumps on surfaces that cause friction, and they increase resistance between objects. So you can see microwelds in carpet pretty easily. On a tile floor, it may appear smooth, but if we actually zoom in on a microscopic level, it's not. There are microwelds there. So the more rough the surface, the greater those microwelds are, so the greater the friction that can be created. Also, the greater the force pushing the two objects together, the greater the friction. This is because there's more opposition um, in those microwelds between the objects, and so that's going to create more resistance. There are three types of friction that we're going to talk about. First is static friction. This is a force between two surfaces that are not moving past each other, but friction will still exist. Sliding friction is the force between two surfaces that are sliding past each other, as if I was pushing this box along the floor, and then rolling friction would be if I was rolling this um, along the surface. So it's when, between a rolling object and the surface that it's rolling on. All right, let's talk a little bit more about air resistance, which is also known as drag or friction in the air. It's determined by three things. First, speed. The greater the speed, the greater the resistance. Also, size. The larger the object, the greater the resistance. And lastly, shape. The flatter the object, the greater the resistance. Think about if you've ever been on an airplane when the airplane's trying to land. There's these um, flaps, if you will, that come up on the wings that um, make there be a flatter shape to help um, you know, create more air resistance, create more drag to slow down the plane. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about gravity and the law of universal gravitation. This law says that any two masses exert an attractive force on each other, but it depends on two things. First, mass. The greater the mass, the greater the gravitational acceleration. So these, this object is much bigger than this one, so it's going to have a greater attraction than these two objects would. This is why you don't feel a gravitational force to the person next to you, but you do feel it to Earth, because Earth is so much more massive than the person next to you. So that attraction of gra gravitational attraction is so much greater. Now, the other thing that this... Um, Attraction depends on is distance. The lower the distance, um, the greater the gravitational attraction. So the sun is much more massive than Earth, so it should have a stronger gravitational attraction to us, right? No, because of distance. We're so much closer to Earth than we are to the sun. Thus, we feel the attraction of Earth more than we feel any attraction towards the sun. So that's what um, this law of universal gravitation depends on. So again, gravity is the attraction to Earth that pulls objects downward. And something I want to make sure you know is this force causes all falling objects to have an acceleration due to gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth. This is regardless of mass and ignoring air resistance. So that's something to keep in mind as we do practice problems. Any practice problems you do in my class, we are going to ignore air resistance and friction. That's something you'll learn how to calculate um, more when you get into um, more advanced classes of physics. And, um, but the mass is regardless. So keep that in mind. If you ever do a practice problem that talks about an object falling and you need its acceleration, you know that, if, again, if we're ignoring air resistance and friction, it would be 9.8 meters per second squared. Speaking of falling objects, let's talk about terminal velocity. This is the maximum velocity a falling object will reach, and it occurs when the force of gravity that's pulling you downward and the force of air resistance that's opposing that uh, downward pull become balanced. So we've got air resistance pushing up and gravity pulling down, and they balance each other out. And we know that when there's balanced forces, the net force is zero, so there's no acceleration and no change in motion. 
This terminal velocity in humans is 55 meters per second, or about 118.06 miles per hour. All right, so now in class, we're going to pause and practice. But again, we're going to keep going for the video. So let's talk about Newton's second law of motion. Let's continue to answer that question, how do motion and force relate? So Newton's second law says a net force acting on an object causes the object to accelerate in the direction of the net force. The greater the mass, the greater the force needed to accelerate it. So it's much easier, easier to accelerate um, or apply a force to accelerate a tennis ball than it would be a bowling ball because the tennis ball is way less massive, so it requires way less force. Also, if you're looking at constant mass, the greater the net force, the greater the acceleration. So if I have two tennis balls and I throw one with much more force than the other, the one with more force will have a greater acceleration. Um, so this picture, this is a little croquet. So when the mallet hits the ball, the ball will accelerate in the direction of the net force that the mallet applied to it. And the greater the force the mallet applies, the faster the ball will move. You can actually summarize this law in an equation, and that is F equals MA. F stands for force, and it is um, measured in newtons. M stands for mass, and it is measured in kilograms. And A stands for acceleration, and is measured in meters per second squared. So let's do an example. You're pushing a friend on a sled. You push with a force of 40 newtons. Your friend and the sled together have a mass of 80 kilograms. Ignoring friction, what is the acceleration of your friend on the sled? So I know that force is 40 newtons, and I know that my mass is 80 kilograms. I'm looking for acceleration, so my A equals question mark. My equation is F equals MA, but I always want what I'm looking for to be isolated, so I need to get the A by itself. So currently it's being multiplied by mass, so I need to do the opposite of that. So I'm going to divide both sides by mass. That allows those to cancel out, and that gives me the equation A equals force divided by mass to use. So now we can plug in. That's 40 newtons divided by 80 kilograms, and I get 0 0.5 meters per second squared. Now, one thing that's important to mention is weight. Weight is the force of gravity on an object. Because it's a force, we can always calculate weight using the formula um, F equals MA if we wanted to. And when we'd be finding weight, we would use for our A, we would use acceleration due to gravity, which would be 9.8 meters per second squared. So let's do an example. Find the weight of a suitcase that has a mass of 42 kilograms. So if m equals 42 kilograms, and my acceleration due to gravity would be 9.8 meters per second squared, what is my force? Well, we know that F equals ma, and what I'm looking for is already isolated, so I can go ahead and plug in. That's 42 times 9.8, which means um, the suitcase would have a weight in newtons of 411.6. So what's the difference between weight versus mass? Because these are often used interchangeably, and that is not correct. So mass, which we'll talk a lot more about later, is the amount of matter in an object, whereas weight is a force of gravity on an object, meaning that it can change based on location, because where you are affects the force of gravity on you. So for example, the further from Earth you are, the lower your weight is. On the moon, your weight is actually one-sixth what it is now because the gravitational attraction on the moon is one-sixth the amount that it is on Earth. If you could be on another planet, your weight would change also based on the gravity of that planet. So you may weigh less on the moon, but in Jupiter, you would actually weigh twice as much because the, for the gravitational force there is twice as great. All right, so we're going to pause and practice Newton's second law for a bit in class, but we're going to keep going here in this video. All right, Newton's last law is the third law, or uh, law of motion is for the third one, and it says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What that means is when one object exerts a force on a second object, the second one exerts a force back on the first that's equal in size and opposite in direction. So when you jump on a trampoline, the trampoline exerts the same force on you that you're exerting on it with your weight, but it's just pushing you in the opposite direction. Another law that I want to touch on before we close is the law of conservation of momentum. 
first, we need to know what momentum is. Momentum is abbreviated with a lowercase p in an equation, and it is um, most simply defined as mass in motion. And it can be calculated as mass times velocity. So p stands for momentum, and the unit for it is kilograms times meters per second. Mass is for the m, and it's measured in kilograms, and then v is for velocity, and it's measured in meters per second. All moving objects have momentum, and momentum can actually be transferred between objects in a collision. So let's do an example. What is the momentum of a car with a mass of 1,300 kilograms traveling at a speed of 28 meters per second? So I'm looking for momentum. I know my mass is 1,300 kilograms, and I know my velocity is 28 meters per second. P equals mv. So we can go ahead and plug in because what we're looking for is already isolated. So that's 1,300 kilograms times 28 meters per second, and that means that the car has a momentum of 36,400 kilograms times meters per second. So, in a collision, because the forces acting on the two objects are equal and opposite, which we learned from Newton's third law, the transfer of momentum must be the same. And this is the law of conservation of momentum, which says that momentum is never created or destroyed in a collision, it's only transferred. So my CP non-honor students, you're done here. Honors, I want you to be able to do some calculations with this. So we're going to do one last example with my honor students. So let's say ball number one is rolling 11 meters per second directly toward a 0 0.17 kilogram ball number two at rest. During the collision, ball number one stops and ball number two is launched forward at 9 meters per second. What is the mass of ball number one? So let's think about the law of conservation of momentum. Y'all, when you get these problems, draw a picture. It makes it so much easier. All right, so we have a ball. This first ball, we do not know its mass. We do know that it's moving, and it's going to hit another ball, and then that ball is going to start moving. So this first ball, again, we don't know its mass, but we do know it has a velocity of 11 meters per second. Ball number two has a mass of 0 0.17 kilograms, and it will have a velocity of 9 meters per second after the collision. So, I can't do anything with this first ball, but this second ball, if I have its mass and velocity, that means I can find its momentum. And according to the law of conservation of momentum, the momentum the second ball has came, all came from its, the first ball. So, I can use this momentum and apply it to this ball in order to rearrange and find its mass. So, I don't know momentum of the first ball or the mass of the first ball, but I do know V1. Um, I don't know P2, but I do know M2 and V2. So first, let's find the momentum of the second ball. That would be the mass of the second ball, which is 0.17 kilograms, times the velocity of the second ball, which is 9. And that gives me a momentum of 1.53 kilograms times meters per second. So I'm going to set this equal to P1, and then I'm going to solve for M1. But I need to rearrange my equation to get M1 by itself. So I need to divide both sides by V1. That gives me M1 equals P1 over V1. Remember, my P1 is the same as P2, so that's 1.53 divided by my first velocity, which is 11. And you get 0 0.14 kilograms for your mass. And that is everything that you need to know for my class on Newton's Laws and Force.